of Washington Square. I'm an alumna of Washington Square College, class of 86, and the Stern School of Business, class of 1990. And I'm also the president of the College of Arts and Science Alumni Association. I am delighted to introduce our moderator, David Lipsky. David is the NYU Creative Writing Program Artist in Residence. David is a contributing editor at Rolling Stone Magazine. His fiction and nonfiction has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's Magazine, The Best American Short Stories, The Best American Magazine Writing, The New York Times, The New York Times Book Review, and many other publications. He contributes as an essayist to NPR's All Things Considered. He's taught at Deerfield and Johns Hopkins and is the recipient of a Lambert Fellowship, which is a media award from GLAAD and the National Magazine Award. David has authored several novels, such as The Art Fair, which is a collection of stories, $3,000, which is a best-selling nonfiction book, Absolutely American, which was a Time Magazine best book of the year, and most recently his book titled, Although of course you end up becoming yourself, A Road Trip with David Foster Wallace. That was a New York Times bestseller and an NPR best book of the year. So thank you both for joining us. We're delighted to have you. Now, David, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Sandra. That was excellent. I, um, have, you're making both me and my mom in absentia blush. So, um, I'm going to start this afternoon off uh, with a quote, uh, a story, and then if I can manage one, a literary insight. They're all about Theron Strauss, who, as Sanji was saying, graduated from our MFA program in 1997 and is one of this reader's favorite writers. Anything Theron Strauss writes is magic. I will be his fan until the sun explodes. That's from the woman who wrote E. Pray Love and Big Magic, as Elizabeth Gilbert is her name, and that's me too. Uh, I became friends with Darren as a fan. I had heard about him and one of his books on NPR, and I read that book with the kind of cursing admiration that you read something with when you love a new book, and it's a new book that you didn't happen to write yourself. After I was successful in making Darren my friend, he told me an interesting story. When he started out, soon after leaving Washington Square, uh, he was invited to meet with the head of one of the Mongo book chains. They had one of those Discover New Writers programs. And she told him an interesting thing. She had gotten into this business uh, for the same reasons everyone else does, out of a love for the word and for what words can uniquely do. But her buying and, and publicizing self, her professional self, had separated the entire bookstore world into two shelves. You had literary and you heard page turner. And then here was Darren, you know, it's a young writer, just trying to stay out of trouble and keep his nose clean. And what he was wondering was, why couldn't you kind of bind the world back together and write books that could be both? That was the challenge Darren set himself as a young writer, and it's the challenge he's thrillingly met for five books now. From his first novel, which the Wall Street Journal, when the Wall Street Journal called him a brave new voice in literature, uh, Salon picked up that scent and called Darren the bravest of writers. Um, to there's not the, the new novel published earlier this week. He's become one of the best writers working today, as Elizabeth Gilbert says, magic. And now my literary insight. I have a theory, which is that writers can kind of hear in advance the footsteps of where the world is headed, that they have a kind of acute social future oriented hearing. And Darren could hear at the turn of the century when he started writing novels that we were moving America and the world into kind of an era of partnerships with social media, with crowdsourcing, with devices that, until the battery fails, keep everyone connected at all times. His first novel, the New York Times bestseller Chang and Eng, was about conjoined twins, the closest partnership imaginable. That's the book that Publishers Weekly called Stunning. He followed that with The Real McCoy, about a boxer and his mentor, a swindler. Darren received the Guggenheim Award for that one. More Than It Hurts You, his third novel, is about the terror of finding out the partner you picked, the co-parent you selected, might not be the person you think they are. If you don't belong to a book club, the Washington Post said, this bitter and brilliant new novel is reason enough to start one. And even his brilliant, his brilliant memoir, published in 2011, is about partnership gone wrong. In half a life, two people try to collaborate on a very specific thing, a moment of safety, of nothing to remember on a highway, nothing having gone wrong. One of them horribly fails. 
this is the book Nick Hornby called Wise, that the critic at BBC called one of the best books I've ever read, and for which Darren received the National Book Critics Circle Award. And I think this theme, this is my second literary insight, has always appealed to Darren because writing is itself always a partnership among life's most fulfilling and dependable and important. And here he is now with another book about two partnerships, the one between Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, and the one between Lucille Ball and his own grandfather, a book that combines memoir and fiction and like all the rest is whatever literary books are and what, and what we all absolutely know page turning is. This is the book that Darren, the, the Colson Whitehead calls big, brassy and big hearted, cold brassy and big hearted, a gorgeous technicolor take on America. The Washington Post just goes with brilliant with hope and a delight. So it's my honor this afternoon to introduce the delightful Darren Scott. I was muted there for a second. Uh, thank you so much, uh, David and Sanji. Um, David, now my mother and yours share a glow on their cheeks. Um, very kind of you. Um, so I think I'll start with uh, a, a short reading from the book. I, I don't think that Zoom readings work that great. So I'm going to read very briefly. Um, and thanks everyone for coming too. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of uh, background about the book and I'll read for a little while and then David and I will talk um, and then you guys can ask questions. Um, the book is about, as David indicated, it's about my grandfather and about Lucille Ball and about the passionate uh, affair that I conjectured between them. Um, so this moment is a year after they meet. They met at a party on Coney Island thrown by uh, Donald Trump's father. And she called my grandfather, whose name is Isidore, she called him Hold On, uh, for reasons you'll have to check out the book to, to understand, but mainly because she didn't like the sound of his name. So this uh, chapter is uh, headed, neither New York nor Los Angeles, May 1950. The woman is on the run from 40 but middle age evidently has quit the chase. 39 years old and she looks good, but does that help? It does not help much. How do you take defeat, the defeat of a life's ambition? Say you're a woman who has kept loyal to a studio and that studio balled up your career and tossed it in the commode. And it's a world for men. And say you've been around a bit. How in this world for men does such a woman crab together a living? Lucille is sitting at a drugstore counter in Buffalo, New York, eating a butterscotch ice cream, and she wonders. Looking good or not, she's 39, aware even now of the lines like tiny shark gills around her eyes. A radio is going at the top of its lungs. Da do, da do, da do, Les Brown and his band of renown on Symphony Sid's nationally broadcast after hours swing session, playing Birdland or maybe the Royal Roost. Do, da do, da do. Desi's at her side talking. Tonight went good, went well. Des is a grammarian, went anxious. Mm-hmm, she says. Lucille's personal movie, her life film, sure doesn't seem like a Capra. It seems at this moment like a Douglas Sirk, soggy plot line and all. Come now, Red, Desi's saying. You don't think we made everybody feel fine tonight? Symphony Sid, she thinks, a particularly New York specimen, one of those Jewish men goofy for jazz. Jewish men, that gets her thinking. Hold On had rolled, uh, rolled up to her again at the end of the Coney Island night after she thought they'd said goodbye and it, be, and it had been lovely on the beach near the city in the rain. That encounter had just been a trifle, however, just something to make Desi jealous, she thought almost convincingly. The man's strongly coiling black hair, thick, brillant, brillantined, and his nose, its hourglass shaped bridge certainly foreign, stirringly familiar, a Jew all right, tall and handsome if memory could be trusted, and thrilling. Not because he in any way was unusual, because he wasn't. Sometimes a woman just needed something different, a nice guy, human and refreshing and normal, but also trickily witty around the eyes. Hold on, look to her like a man who ruffled life on the head, and a whole year has rolled by. 
Ah, enough inappropriate memory. Sure, sweetie, Lucille her, hears herself say to Desi. Well read, so then our plan might finally work. Desi swallows, but his smile is a guest who's forgotten to leave. Will it? He says. Lucille's face tightens a little. Why is ice cream so much better in places like this, she says, kind of sharply. Buffalo, Desi nods and narrows his eyes in disbelief. <laughs> Buffalo. The plan, the plan, the stupid plan. Months back, CBS, which hadn't wanted to sacrifice any of its studio properties, even the most lackluster shows, CBS had been interested maybe in repurposing Lucille Ball's failed radio program, The Madcap Bride, for TV. That was the rumor, anyway. TV, the mongrel new medium. Well, count her in. Even that flickering appliance beats unemployment. But of course, a problem. Bride's husband had been played by Richard Denning, blonde hair, Gerber cheeks, middling charisma. Lucille liked Denning. She'd also planned to replace him. Not that Lucille, at that career moment, had much power to issue ultimatums. But working with her husband was the only chance she'd have to dust off her marriage, get it back on its feet. The ball Arnezes were often apart, frosty, and thwarted. Desi'd cheat to his heart's content. Would Lucille go off to film a show without him? She came up with a scheme then to have him at her side all the time. But CBS didn't think the public would. He built, hell, CBS execs themselves didn't accept a redhead married to a Cuban. That forced the Arnezes to prove that middle America would buy what they were selling. If we can show you crabs accept it, then you must. So under the aegis of their new company, Desilu Productions, meaning as Lucille saw it, we're the saps who fork out $20,000 for basically a public audition. The Arnezes now tour what remains of the dying vaudeville theaters, covering the seaboard with pratfalls and puns also a bunch of the Midwest. Save the career and the marriage, was her thinking. Even the accountant says the tour will bankrupt them. Okay, I think I'll stop there. And- uh, Wait, but, <laughs> but does the tour bankrupt them? You can't stop there. You know, that's, that's, there's this thing called yeah. pitch turning where <laughs> you try to, you try, you, you got it. Um, no, I just, I, I feel like, you know, leave him wanting more, as as uh, Lucille said. I think she's the one who came up with that phrase. Actually, it wasn't okay. Close. So, um, what we're going to do is Darren and I are going to talk for a bit, and then we're going to invite questions. So, as um, as questions occur to, to people, please just put them in the Q and A uh, on the Q and A feed, and we'll begin. I'll, I'll begin feeding them to Darren, and. Um, and then, you know, maybe Darren will stand up and do a trick as I feed him the, uh, the questions. Yeah, my thing, um, because so, yeah. hey, it has to come through the aging filter that somehow got put on my computer. Is this what I look like now? No, um, so Darren, tell, tell us, why did you pick Lucille Ball? I mean, you've written about conjoined twins, you've written about turn of the century Carmen, and you've written about turn of the century marriages that some might describe as troubled. And what, what led you to the path of Lucille Ball who in a way is the, is the kind of figure behind so much in modern pop culture. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it, that last part uh, that you just mentioned. I mean, she is a beloved figure who I, whose influence I think is perhaps underappreciated. I mean, everyone knows how popular she was. Well, I'll tell you exactly how popular she was. She was, her show was so, so popular that when it would cut to commercial, the water tables in all the big cities would drop. So it was, it was measurable in the reservoirs of New York and Detroit and, uh, and Chicago that they would all dip at the same moment. And it's because the entire country flushed at the same time. She was so popular that everyone went to the bathroom in the commercial break because you don't, you don't want to miss anything when, you, when the show is that. I mean, it's, you know, it, it's, uh, it's testament to her popularity and also to the, how different the world was. There were only three shows on at once. And uh, the most popular show on network TV now is also a CBS show, NCIS, which is watched by 8 million people a week. <clears throat> her show was watched by the equivalent of 85 million people a week. So 10 and a half times more popular than the most popular show. So that, that, that alone, I think, is fascinating. But beyond that, there's a lot of stuff about her people just don't remember. I mean, I mentioned so there. Lucille, Lucille Ball had the Lucille Ball had the power of ten NCISs. Yes, um, and that's and that's uh, 
a measurement I want to get in in, <laughs> in circulation. So let, let's work on that. But yeah, um, so there's there's that. But also, as I sort of alluded to in that excerpt there, uh, she was behind the first famous interracial marriage on TV, and she had to fight for that. And I think that's pretty cool. Um, she was the first woman mogul uh, in Hollywood. Um, as you alluded to, David, uh, the only reason we have shows like Mission Impossible and Star Trek, because she was kind of a visionary and took a chance on it. I mean, Star Trek was a very weird uh, pitch. It was pitched as the UN in space. And so like, you know, who would take the flyer on that? Well, she, she said, that sounds cool. Uh, you know, all the networks said, that seems terrible. And so she saw this thing and, and brought it to market. And uh, as you mentioned, Star Trek changed culture forever. That's why we have Star Wars and, and Star Wars and Star Trek together are the impetus for so much modern culture. And she also invented the sitcom, you know, um, the actual format of it, the three, cam the three camera sitcom, the live audience. Wow. Uh, but beyond that, just the, the format followed by so many shows like Seinfeld and uh, uh, well, you know, she, so she's named Lucy and her character's named Lucy, just as Jerry's named Jerry. It's, it's a bunch of friends in an apartment. I mean, she, she was this seminal figure. And I think she's sometimes, uh, sometimes an icon is so ubiquitous that they slip from view. And I think that's happened with her. So I wanted to, I wanted to bring her back into the spotlight, but also she's this incredibly powerful brilliant woman and she was humiliated by her husband. I mean, he was a, a brilliant businessman too, but um, in the, at the height of their fame, uh, and this is a period that's so prim as, as we know that even married couples were not allowed to be shown um, sleeping in the same bed. So that's, that's the sort of uh, prudish era we're talking about. And at the height of her fame in 1953, Confidential Magazine wrote an expose uh, catching him out with two prostitutes. So we'll think about how humiliating that, humiliating that would have been for her. Uh, so I thought, you know, what a great opportunity to give her a little payback. Oh I, uh, I, I wrote her the closest thing to revenge you could find in Predorable Print. I gave her a love affair of her own. And so what would bring you from writing something like in 2011 you wrote your most personal book which is the memoir uh, the memoir more than it hurts you uh, rather um half a life which is your national book critic circle uh, award-winning book um how would you go from writing something so personal to something which is personal for the rest of us because when you were describing lucille ball just now what she sounds like it sounds like the way we take for granted our parents like here we have lucille ball who is like the mom of all these different threads of sitcoms where like Larry David or Seinfeld can play themselves and then of Star Trek and then Star Wars and Star Wars leads to George Lucas becoming a worldwide figure and Spielberg becoming a worldwide figure for being able to do even better versions of Star Wars and then that leads to the Marvel movies so you have someone who is so ubiquitous that we almost take them for granted and forget about them the way we do about our parents yeah. um, how would you go from how would you how would you move towards that from writing a book which is just about you, about your own small world, and a book which had been met with such huge acclaim? Well, I wanted to, as you alluded to in, the, in your very kind uh, introduction, I wanted to write a book that disproved what that woman from Barnes Noble talked about. So she said there are two kinds of books. There's the literary novel that you have to read very slowly and savor the language, and then there's the page turner. And I thought, you know what, um, I want to see if I could do both. And Updike talks about this, uh, and you and I have discussed this. Updike in the, in the Beck books talks about how after Melville, uh, there were two sort of schools of, of writing in American letters where there's uh, the Henry James, very uh, psychologically acute, but slow, slowly paced, uh, language heavy books and then there's the Dreiser type books where there's an amazing story that that sort of ties together a lot of what's going on in the country and and so I thought you know this would be an exam a chance to do both to to write a really fun story that actually has something interesting to say about America and if I did a good job would also be very uh psychologically uh 
acute and and uh, lyrical and and tell the story of a great love story. I mean, I was also influenced by um, Love in the Time of Cholera. I feel like there aren't that many great contemporary American uh, novels about love. You know, the interesting part of every love story happens as soon as the romantic comedy ends. Like, okay, now they're together. How do those two people with their irreconcilable differences make something work? Um, so that that was one part. Especially if their marriage is about a sitcom too. Their marriage is about, is about producing a weekly romantic comedy for 85 million people who apparently desperately need the bathroom. <laughs> well, they, they, yeah, or, well, so that's the other interesting thing. Her show was basically America's civic bond. It was our lives felt bound up back then with her marriage and, and that was a lot of pressure. So they, she actually got a divorce as soon as the show was over. Wow. The fa yeah, the, the, their last kiss came at the last scene of their last show. So they kissed, the director yelled cut, his, uh, Desi's face is in her hair, they start crying. She kisses him back on the forehead after the camera ends and the next day they're divorced. It's an amazing scene in the book. Um, I have a, a, quick, uh, a quick point of order from, from Karen and baby QT Macauer. Um, Karen is pointing out that she thinks that Desi is the one who invented the three camera technique, which of course is part of that thing, right? Their marriage is creating a lot of the terms of the world that we live in now, including how we dissolve marriages. Yeah, I mean, she did give Desi a lot of credit. He, as I mentioned, he was Thanks, a brilliant Karen. businessman. Um, but you know, they were a partnership. It's very hard to know exactly who came up with what. She, she did say that he came up with that, uh, but she was a very generous person. Um, and their marriage was real, their love was really interesting. You know, people, uh, an interviewer asked me recently, you know, it must have been hard for them to, to have this sort of great love before the American people when their marriage was so terrible. And it really wasn't terrible. I mean, it was very difficult and complicated, but she loved him and he loved her their entire lives. So even after she divorced him, she basically says in her autobiography that she didn't love her second husband as much as she loved him. Uh, tough read for that guy. Uh, and uh, her and, and Desi's second wife looked just like Lucille. Um, so, you know, that, uh, but you know, that's in a way why I wrote this book because you mentioned that the book is fiction and nonfiction and you asked also why did I write this book after the, after the memoir? So I realized after having written novels uh, and, and memoirs, that a, a kind of new form could be really fun and, and could do what neither could do on its own. So as you know, David, when you write fiction, the challenge is with each scene, with each page, you ask yourself, wow, would this really happen? Um, could this, uh, is this believable? And the benefits of fiction are, you know, if the story's boring, you say, well, you know, I'll add a gun here. I'll make it more exciting. Um, so, so the benefits are, are obvious compared to nonfiction, but the, the difficulties are, you know, you always wonder, is this character compelling? Uh, is this something that really would happen? And with nonfiction, it's, it's the converse. You, you, know, you know it would happen because it actually did happen. And, and if you pick a compelling character, you know that it's a compelling uh, person you're writing about. But when the story is boring, or if you're blocked access to certain facts, you can't mess with that. And so the book, is limited in its interest sometimes. And so with, I thought, you know, if I write about Lucille Ball, a woman who I know is compelling, and I write about something that I know actually happened, a kind of fame that seems unbelievable today, but is true, uh, that would be fun. And then if I, if I do it as literature, I could do things that, a, that a, a biography couldn't, because she's very, withholding in her autobiography, Lucille. It's a really flat book because she doesn't say what it's like to be her. And so a biographer has to bump up against that wall all the time. You know, you can read 10 biographies of Lucille as I did and not get any sense of what it was like to be her. So I thought, okay, why don't I mix these two genres? And if I do a good job, it will not only be something kind of new under the sun, but will will be entertaining in ways that both those genres are or neither of those genres can be on their own. 
And can you tell us more about the memoir side of this novel? Oh yeah, thanks. I, I uh, <laughs> didn't I didn't talk about that. So it's the story of, of Lucille, as I said, but it's also a story of my grandfather. So my grandfather actually met Lucille Ball at a party thrown by Donald Trump's father. And a very fortuitous thing for me. I mean, I started writing this book a long time ago. How is anything involving Donald Trump fortuitous? <laughs> well, it's fortuitous because um, it's, uh, it, it gets to show what's, what's unfortunate about the current moment. I mean, the book is an examination of fame and how warping fame is in some ways. So my grandfather had this sort of just so life in Long Island with a pretty, oh. with a pretty good marriage. And then he has this brush with the most charismatic, famous, glamorous person in the world. And that warps his view of his life and he can never be happy again, uh, unless he has more of that addictive substance that we call fame. Um, but so at this party, Donald Trump's father, being a master manipulator of the press, like his son, uh, came up with a way to avoid controversy. So the, it takes place at Coney Island, the first amusement park in the world, uh, or certainly the modern world. I mean, you could argue about Rome, but so the first modern amusement park uh, in history. And at, at Coney Island, there's this beautiful glass and steel cathedral called, called uh, the Palace of Fun, beautiful historic landmark. And Trump's father wants to tear it down to create crappy housing. So in order to avoid the controversy of that, he has this giant party where he invites a bunch of celebrities and the press. And at the stroke of midnight, all the celebrities throw a brick through this glass building, destroying it as the flash bulb well, pop. That's what he's been doing with America. Ha, exactly. So, um, so that's, that's how the book starts. That's where they meet. Um, and you know, my grandfather is a, it was a fascinating figure in my life uh, because he did all these shitty things. He did all these crappy things. He abandoned my grandmother, uh, left her for her best friend, and everyone immediately took my grandfather's side. Even my grandmother, her entire life, the last 35 years of her life, she spent as a hermit and an alcoholic. And she still called my grandfather her husband, even though he was living with her best friend. On her deathbed, I happened to be there when she died. One of the saddest things I've ever seen in person was her talking to the nurse right before she died about her husband. Now I know I knew that he had left her and was living in a common law marriage with another woman. And so I thought, you know, I, this could be a way also to merge the personal and the public. So I, there was this great mystery in my life. What happened with my grandparents? Uh, was he, how, how early was unfaithful? Why did he have this power over my grandmother and, and my family? So if I, I thought if I could mix, um, as you said, the uh, the intimate that worked, hopefully worked well in my last book and the public in this book, it could, you know, I, I want this book to be what I had called uh, in an essay in the Times a few years ago, full dress fiction, where you do everything. So it has the intimate and the familial, it has the public uh, and, and the colossal. So, um, so I wanted this book to be, you know, nonfiction and fiction, historical and contemporary, uh, intimate and public. And so I think that's why it took me a long time. I don't think I could have written this book uh, earlier in my, in my career because I didn't have the chops. No, and also, and your prose has gotten better with every book. So I don't think that the Darren who started out with, um, with that book that the Wall Street Journal called So Brave, I think even with his bravery, he wouldn't have had anything like the ability you show in this book. But that piker you know, couldn't have done shit. <laughs> um, Judith Sussman uh, has a question. And her question is a really interesting one. It is, is that story real or fiction? The one about the bricks being thrown at the glass palace. So thank you, Judith. And Darren? That's true. Yeah, that's absolutely true. So I say in the end, uh, what is true and what's not. I think, you know, um, I've gotten, it just came out the book, but I've been lucky enough to get some, uh, some reviews early. And uh, the reviews have all been quite kind. The, the, the one, question that LA Times had is uh, what was true and what was fake and and that's in in the in the afterward I I, I lay out all the things uh, and what's what's real and what's not because I, I didn't want to frustrate readers uh, as you say in your in your book David about David Foster Wallace uh, he would ask how much reader annoyance can you uh, do you want to yeah. <laughs> do you want to brave as a, as a writer I, I didn't want to brave that much so so I do lay out at the end what is true and what's not but um, 
but there is some gamesmanship there but it's it's fiction and nonfiction, so that that sort of uh twinning happens throughout the book um but yeah that's true and that, and it's a fascinating thing like, you know that what a, what an amazing scene i happened to stumble upon you know sometimes you get lucky as a writer no it's a it's a magical scene it was funny reading the early reviews because it's like that first scene is both magical and it is technicolor and so i remember thinking when i read what elizabeth gilbert said and what the pulitzer prize winner colson whitehead said i thought man they had the same response to that scene with trump and his dad and that palace being broken that i had as a reader it's always one of the fun things about reading is seeing if other people respond to this very private experience they're having with the book in the same way that you did you're very kind um, can you um <clears throat> can you tell us um a little bit about what made you want to start writing. I'm always fascinated by that. Like you came from this program, you're an alumnus of this great program. What made you decide that you were going to begin adding to its fame by becoming one of its most successful graduates? Uh, I don't, I don't even remember. I just always wrote. I mean, I don't know if, if you feel that way. There wasn't like a eureka moment. You were, you know, I, um, I, uh, when I was, in third grade, I started writing a novel about Frankenstein, or actually an army of Frankensteins. And the only scene I remember is um, uh, the army, the US army, gathering, all the entire army gathering in one giant room. And the general, there's only one general in the army as I imagine it, asking everybody, do you want to use Uzis or M16s? And they voted for Uzis, and they went out and fought Frankenstein. So that. That novel's coming out next week, actually. <laughs> yeah, I was kidding. I was thinking about maybe putting you in touch with some uh, some of the folks I know out in Hollywood because that sounds pretty good. I just so, so, but, but to answer your question, I was I was writing stories always, and so um, so I always just wanted to do it. Uh, I think I got serious about it after the incident you mentioned in in my memoir. I had a very serious car accident when I was eighteen, um, and that sort of uh, one of the things that happened was a girl died, the girl who swerved her bicycle in front of my car. And I found out only years later that she was committing suicide. Uh, so I lived with that guilt and pain for a long time. And at the funeral, her mother said to me, you have to live your life for two people. You have to do it twice as well. You have to be twice as successful, twice as happy, twice as ambitious, which is quite a lot to put on a young kid. Oh. Um, but at that, I think, at that moment, I thought, well, okay, I'm going to try to do something cool with my life, I guess. And so uh, I think that was an impetus to do it. And <clears throat> can you tell us <clears throat> a little bit about your process, like this book? How many drafts did it take? And when you're sitting down to write, how do you go about it? Do you use outlines? Do you um, do, you do multiple drafts? Uh, well, I... I'll ask you the same question, but you know, I and, think, and then, um, and then, uh, and then we have two questions coming in from the audience after this as well. So I'm watching the clock. So great. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So, I mean, so much of everyone has their own methodology, right? So uh, I studied with the old doctor at NYU, the great uh, founder of the, of the program that you and I both teach in. And he famously said, I'm probably, I'm going to butcher the quote, but something like writing a book for him was just like writing uh, uh, driving in in a, in a thick fog, and you, he said, you know, I'm only able to see as far in front of my car as the length of my headlights, so I can I can barely go ahead, but that's enough to get where you're going. Hmm. So for him, he didn't he didn't know anything. He didn't do any any sort of uh, drafting or, or plot outlining. And then I have another friend, this writer uh, Douglas Glover, who writes down on cue cards before he starts composition, what every scene will be, in what order, and how long. So he knows before he, what do you say? And he just he burns the cards, he gets guess for home, yeah. <laughs> but so he knows before he starts writing, everything that will happen, and within two or three pages, how long the book will be, which to me seems insane, but it works for him. So I'm somewhere in between, I think, where I, I like to sort of, uh, this is something similar, I guess, to what Roth would do. I would try to write for like a hundred pages, not knowing where I'm going, just to sort of get a sense of the characters and what the story is. And then when I have a sense of what the story is, I feel like I need to have some sort of roadmap after that. So then I'll sort of stop and, and in, a, in sort of a 
loose way, I'll, I'll figure out what the plot's going to be and then try to get there. But I, I also give myself room to, uh, to deviate, you know, but you and I both have written uh, for the screen as well. So it's different when you're writing a screenplay, you have to, you have to know exactly where you're going. And I think that actually helped me when I went back to writing uh, fiction because that sort of focus on, on storytelling uh, <laughs> stops you from, from being lapidary where you just sort of uh, spin around and, and, and uh, enjoy the sound of your own sentences, but don't think about, you know, how does, how does the next, how, how does, how does one, how does the character step from this room to the next room? <laughs> Perfect. And then um, along the, along the other sort of the more workman type thing, which one has to do when one is moving into events that are true to the world, as opposed to being true to our inner experience, which is what so much of writing is. Um, Atelka Blazer is asking during your research, what was the most surprising thing about Lucy's life that you didn't know before that you found out? Oh, so many. That's a great, that's a great question. So one of the benefits of having learned so much about Lucy is that I've started writing a bunch of articles, nonfiction articles about her. Uh, so I wrote something for the Vanity Fair about how Desi was caught with prostitutes, which I mentioned. I wrote something for the New York Times, which is another cool thing I found out. Um, she was such a striver. And that's, that's I think, this, the key to her success. So she... Um, she came to New York City at 16 from upstate New York. And they said, you're not talented, go home. And she came back 10 times before she graduated high school and failed every time. And then went out to LA and failed out there. So she, from 16 to 40, she kept failing and she kept trying. Um, and she would, she said, I'm not the best singer. I, I, I can't sing. I'm not a good dancer. Uh, I'm not the prettiest actress. And this is a misogynistic time when even more than now, looks mattered too much. Uh, so she said, I can't sing, I can't dance, I'm not the prettiest, I'm not a really great actress. I'm an okay actress. I'm not that funny, I can't, I can't write any jokes. But what she did have is the ability to work really hard and to be relatable. And I think that's something so, that's really fascinating. So the thing I wrote for the Times was about how after she was the most famous woman in the history of the world by some measures, she said, you know, I always failed on Broadway. I'm gonna go back and try to make it on Broadway. And she failed again at 60. And I think that was such a cool thing to try. And then, you know, and, and she was okay with it because, you know, you, you, if you, you know, and this is what you learn every time you put a book in the world. If you don't put, it's very easy not to put something out there, but when you put something out there, there you risk failure, but that's the only way cool stuff gets made. It's like that quote that, um, that Sadie Smith, who of course teaches in our program too, it's that quote that she loves from Ian Forster, which is that you shouldn't expect not to fail, but that you should expect to fail a little bit better each time. Yeah, I, I, thought, um, that was, uh, I thought that was Beckett. Maybe it was Beckett. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I, in fact, I have failed just now to remember. <laughs> I, I should have correct you, but I thought maybe it's, maybe, maybe, yeah. But no, no, and then uh, Adam Dalva has that question, which is sort of about how things work in our program. How has teaching writing workshops, like you were, you were learning under, under doctorate, right? How has teaching workshops and craft classes in our program, how has that affected your own writing? Like where are the benefits? You and I talk about this all the time, David. Yeah. Uh, we talk about this a lot. I think there's a lot of benefits in there and there are some risks. I think the risks are that you become very self-conscious. So if you teach someone how to walk up and down the stairs, you will analyze a footfall in great depth. Ah. Then when you walk up and down the stairs, you, you might be a little self-conscious about it. Um, but I think that overall, it's very helpful. And I tell this to my students all the time, because one of the great things about NYU is that we allow our grad students to uh, teach. And having to elucidate your first principles sort of makes you come up with first principles, right? So when you have to tell people, okay, how do I make a, a, a book interesting? How do I make a character well-rounded? How, how do I write a sentence uh, with modifiers that energize that sentence? You have to then figure out, okay, well, how do I do this? You know, what seems very instinctual sometimes in writing is all this stuff that we do, but when you have to sort of tell other people how to do it, it forces you to come up with principles of your own that can be very helpful when you get back to the desk. That's actually great. Um, 
We have another question from Lisa Gerard. She wanted you to name, if you could, some of the writers or the specific books that you turn to when you're maybe stuck sometimes when you're writing. Are there some, and are there some that served you especially well in writing this particular book about your grandfather and about Lucy? Well, that's a good question. I mean, I, I, uh, I wrote something about this recently about how um, there are some books that I love, but that sometimes when I'm writing, they're almost too excellent. They're like giant chilly skyscrapers that seem so for, foreboding, or forbidding rather, that, uh, that I found them hard to read. So, uh, and so certain writers I like a lot, like David Foster Wallace, uh, I found he was so loose uh, that I couldn't use him in writing about the 50s because it was like coming to a party with your tux a little uh, untucked. So I, I really like um, V.S. Pritchett, so I found him really useful. Um, but then, you know, but then of course the great writers that I said were foreboding, sometimes I would just turn to them for their excellence, like uh, Penin by Nabokov is so great, or Nabokov if you're less pretentious. Um, uh, I found um, and so can you Laurie us, Moore really helpful. Um, but can you tell us uh, a little Morrison. About, but in talking about turning to them, so because a lot of people who are starting out writing or maybe stuck in a project, they may not know how to back out. Like one of the things that's been fun watching George Saunders, who's a writer that we both love and who both a lot of our students uh, admire and who came and read and um, had one of the, I thought one of the most sort of most lovely Q and A's here. He began talking about this issue, which is he told our students that a lot of times you can be writing and you expect it to come out perfectly. And that the point between someone who is gonna finish their work and then get it published and someone who isn't is that they learn to expect that it's not gonna come out that well. And I remember Saunders saying that's when he turns to the writers he loves. Can you, is, is, there, is there an experience you have that's like what Saunders is talking about? Yeah, so I, I think that's a great point. I think the young writers don't often know because we're so trained to avoid plagiarism for good reason that we have, we're sometimes afraid to have models. And I think all the great artists, not just writers, have models in mind where you know you learn how to do this job by seeing how other people do it. Um, and so I mentioned V.S. Pritchett. I teach this uh, to my craft class. V.S. Pritchett was a fan of an earlier writer named Isaac Babel. And he, um, he found a story of Babel's uh, called My First Fee. And he basically lifted the plot and wrote that same story himself, uh, but changed the autobiographical details of the, of the protagonist and made it his own. I think it's a better story. So, you know. Um, so you can get friend. ideas from other writers too. Yeah, your yeah, ideas. Prose lessons, how, how to modify, uh, how, to, how to have a compact metaphor you could learn from reading Penin or Laurie Moore. You know, how to, uh, how to um, write a great character you could learn from Tolstoy. What Tolstoy would do is Tolstoy would break his characters down to their essence. So he would say, Karenin, Anna Karenin's husband, his essence was that he was a drag on her. So every time he wrote something about Karenin, it's almost a tick when you know that he does that. He talks about Karenin sitting heavily in his chair, oh, holding his books heavily. Um, but he also realized that that will make a character one dimensional. So he, he realized you can make a character move within his essence and you know we get it. Uh, and that's the kind of stuff that you can remember. If you're forgetting how to do that, you can then turn to the books that you love and you can get an immediate sort of demonstration of how to solve a problem you're having with your own work. Yeah, and you know, basketball players will watch a lot of tape. You know, it's not just writers. Michael Jordan, if you watch that great documentary about him, you know, he would watch tape of himself and other players just to get ready for games. Okay. And I think, you know, that's, that's basically what writers should do. I have a lot of students, and you probably too, do as well, David, who say, when I first come into an undergrad class, I want to be a writer. And you say, okay, who do you like to read? Well, I don't read that much. And I huh. say, what, do you, what have you written? I haven't written that much yet. And it's like saying, I want to play baseball for the Yankees. Uh, I want to play short stuff for the Yankees. Okay, who do you like? I don't really watch baseball. <laughs> okay, along the same lines, and this is a similar question to what to what Lisa and Adam were asking, and these have all been great questions, is what did, this is from NK, what did Doctorow teach you, either in person or as you were just discussing in reading his books, 
about kind of making that fusion between fact and between what's novel writing, what's fiction. Dr. O gave a great piece of advice that I didn't really understand until I started writing historical fiction. I just got a note from Judith Sussman to stop uh, jitter, being jittery, so I'll, I'll try to stay still. Thanks, Judith. Um, so uh, what Dr. O said was, when you're writing fiction, do the least amount of research you can get away with. Um, and I thought that was facetious or, or I just didn't get it. But then you realize when you write a novel that your responsibilities are different from those of the historian. So a historian has to get the facts right. What a novelist has to do is tell a good story and the facts are secondary. You have to do just enough to make the magic trick believable, right? Hmm. So I will now write without knowing what's gonna, without knowing that much about the world. And then when I run into trouble, I'll do the research and, and, and fill it in. I think the point, the key to that sentence is what you can get away with. You can write historical fiction and not get away with it because you're not doing enough research. But if you do too much, you know, we're all human beings. We're all sort of lazy. If you do a lot of work, you're going to feel obligated to put that work in the, in the text, right? So I think your responsibility is to tell a good story and to let the research prop that up and not vice versa. And so many historical drafts I read from students that don't work have tons and tons of research and you keep saying, well, where's the story? And you feel like, you feel that they spent 30 hours this week in the library, so they've got to get that, they've got to get their money. <laughs> so that doctoral quote must be in your mind all the time. Okay, let me, let me move on to um, a really interesting thing that, that, that Evan uh, Cerneglia is saying, which is Tolstoy famously wrote of war and peace. And uh, Evan, this is, um, this is like a lovely essay that you should be publishing. Uh, this should be the first, the first graph of an essay as opposed to me wasting it just in, you know, on the air, but I'm gonna go ahead anyway. Tolstoy famously wrote of War and Peace that it was not a novel, still less an epic poem, and still less a historical chronicle. His approach reminds me of yours a bit, making the historical personal, bringing it to life. You didn't know I'd be acting this one out, Evan, did you? Um, <laughs> when did you decide to merge the personal with the historical? Was it always gonna be a fiction slash memoir hybrid? That's a great question, Evan, thank you. I mean, each book I think tells you what it's going to be. So I mentioned my last book. Um, I, people said to me, you're a novelist, why don't you write this as fiction? But I felt like that would just not work. I, I thought if I wrote about that accident and made it a novel, for me, novels involve a kind of intellectual play, and that would have seemed disrespectful to the event. So that had to be a memoir. This, I thought, you know, I want to tell a story of Lucille Ball. And I want to tell a story of my grandfather, but if I, if I don't tell it as fiction, as I mentioned before, I won't be able to tell it as fully as possible because the interesting thing about literature is that even though it's made up, even though fiction is made up, it can be the most truthful kind of portrait of a thing there is because you don't have to be bound by what you know and don't know. You, I can't write as truthfully about Lucille Ball if I stick to the facts because I don't know what she actually felt, so I can't give a truthful portrait of fame. And, you know, David and I talk about this a lot. This is a, I'll, I'll quote you here, David. You, you say, I think to your classes that, if, if speaking of war and peace, if you want to learn what it's like in 1850s Russia, uh, you don't, or 18, I guess it's earlier, 1814 Russia, you don't um, go back and read the newspaper accounts of the Napoleonic period. You go back and read war and peace because he, even though he's telling something that's not strictly true, will give you the most true portrait of that time because he, as a great novelist, can give the texture of that moment in all its depth because he can say what people are feeling, what they're thinking, what, they're, what they look like, what, what it sounds like, when, which you can't do if you stick to the facts because you're not there. So in a way, by doing it as partially fiction, you can be much more honest and accurate and true than if you were just saying, she went to the studio that day, they filmed the show, she went home. That was great, and great, and great question, Evan, thank you. Yeah. Um, this is from Jessica DeHart, and Jessica writes, I'm an MFA Paris student of Darren's, and I've never asked, what's your work life like, daily habits, writing hours, and when do you find time with teaching and with writing these great five books, when do you find time to read? Oh, thanks, yeah, so I wake up at three and, and run with the bulls. <laughs> And then I write two or three books. No, I just, you know, it's a struggle, especially in the pandemic, I find it a real struggle to, 
to do anything. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm the father of young or not so young anymore kids. Um, I teach, uh, I, I'm in a, a marriage, I write. So I, it, I find it really hard to do all I need to do. Um, so I think sometimes the, write, the reading is what slips. And that's a shame because as David teaches his class uh, too, so much of being a good writer is just reading all the time for the reasons that David mentioned 20 minutes ago. You know, if you need a refresher on what makes a good story, it's, it's helpful to read people who've done this better than you have and earlier than you have and more often than you have. So, you know, um, I mentioned John Updike and what he said about uh, uh, Melville. You know, Updike wrote, I don't know how many great books, you know, uh, he was so prolific. Uh, and so you have that entire swath of the shelf to turn to and it's really helpful because he wrote all kinds of books. If you want to read historical fiction, there's an Updike for that. If you want to read an essay, there's an Updike for that. But if you cut yourself off from that, you know, you're working in a void. And so, I don't know, I, I, I so remember- when do you, but, but tell us about your schedule. Like, when do you find the time to do that? I'm just, I'm just watching the clock, so forgive me. But like, just because for me, when I was starting out, and you and I have talked about this with our students too, it's so good to know that people have the same hard time scheduling. You know what I mean? So, so tell us what your schedule is, and then we'll have time for one more question. And then we'll release everybody. It's been a fascinating hour and I would love to go on, but we do have to wrap this up in about five or six minutes. Yeah, well, marshalling your time is very important, right? So yeah. um, when I first started, it was even harder, I think, because I had a full-time job that wasn't writing and I was going to NYU uh, at night. So um, how did you do that, by the way? Like just practically, what were you doing then? You're yeah. going to NYU at night, you have a full-time job. How did you solve that problem? So I would... Uh, I got an apartment near my office just for this reason. I thought, I thought, okay, I can't, the job I had was a crappy job writing for a financial technology newsletter. So my brain was dribbling out of my ears at the end of the day. So I thought, okay, what I have to, I can't write after work because I, I, I spent the entire day writing drivel. So I thought, okay, I get an apartment near my office and I'll wake up early. I knew that I could get to work at 10 o'clock and not be fired. Um, and so I woke up at seven and I wrote from seven to nine fifty, threw on my clothes and then went to work. So I would write three hours a day before, before work. And then I would read at night before bed. Um, and you know, a great piece of advice from Dr. O, another piece of advice from Dr. O, not a writing advice, not a bit of writing advice, but a bit of practical wisdom was, he said, when, if you want to be a writer, give it, give it your all before you need to make money for real. So he said, he said, do your job as your hobby and, and do your hobby as your job. So do the least amount you need to do not to get fired at work. So I, I was not a good reporter for that financial technology newsletter because I was writing my book at work as much as I could. And I was always on the cusp of getting fired because this was when I was in my 20s and I thought, okay, I don't have to support a family. If I'm fired, it'll be bad, but it won't be the end of the world. So I did... I did that for as long as I could. And then I wrote on the weekends. I thought I can't have, and this is a quote I've got from you. You said, I think you say this to your students, you're asking for something really extraordinary in your life. You're asking to make your living writing fiction. So you have to put an extraordinary amount of time in. I think that's what you said. Uh, so you have to put the work in. I'm gonna in. say it now anyway. <laughs> you have to put the work in. So yeah, I would write three hours a day before work, read a little bit after work, and then, and I was able still to have a social life. I, I'm, I need, I'm someone who needs to be with people or I'll, I'll go crazy. So I thought, okay, I can do the same thing in the weekend. I'll wake up early in the weekend. I'll write in the mornings and I'll still see my friends in the afternoon and night. So I, I had a full life, you know, girlfriend, friends, all that stuff. And I still man, managed to, to do it. I just felt like I'll sacrifice a little sleep and I'll, I'll sacrifice a nice apartment to get one near my office. Great. Um, that reminds me of something that when Laurie Moore Laurie Moore gave two bits of advice. One that's directly relevant to what Darren was saying, and then one which is just useful for anybody who's starting out, whatever age they are. And then we'll take one more question, and then I'll thank everyone um, for coming and give the floor back uh, um, to Sonji. Um, but what Laurie Moore said is two things. You have to be, it's just what Darren was saying. She said that if you want to write, you have to be prepared to have five friends instead of 11 because the time that you would be using to socialize is going to be going into the, is going, is going to be going into the page. And the second thing that she said is that 
um, when you want to start writing, if you want to start writing, you have to be willing to write something that you would never want to show your parents. And she said that when she says that to her students, a bunch of them say, I could never do that. And she thinks, well, they're not going to be the ones writing. Um, okay, so this is the last question. It's from Ed Winston. Well, the good part of that, I just got a really angry letter from my aunt about this book. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. Perfect, perfect example. So, so you should probably um, email Vanderbilt and say that Laurie Moore's uh, advice is still operative and uh, actionable intelligence now. Um, so this is from Ed Winstead. It's read that sense of accuracy and truth. How did you approach sort of period accuracy for the 50s and 60s on a granular level? Like you're changing major details of people's lives, but what about getting the quotidian day-to-day -day things right? He's a, and Ed writes that he's thinking about Mad Men, who has a great thing. In, the, um, in Mad Men, for the meal scenes, they would have smaller chickens because uh, you know, the people working at Tyson had perfected the art over the decades of making the chickens into like Frankensteins. Mm -hmm. And these were, these were more Toulouse-Lautrec chickens that people were eating in the 50s. And so what he's asking is, how do you get that kind of stuff right? Is it, is it a waste of time to get it right? Or, you know, adding those kinds of details, does it just justify your library time? Or does it actually add to people's appreciation of the stuff that you've made out of taking history and making it into living fiction and life in the reader's brain? That's a great question, uh, and that's Ed, who is also a graduate and now is the editor of uh, Guernica. Um, thank you, Ed. Uh, it's a tough one. I think there's a difference between the writing for the screen and, and a book. So I worked with Gary Oldman, the actor, on a screenplay for uh, Chang and Ang, my book, which never got made, and I think it's because Gary was so caught up on this stuff. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna lean on doctor again, because Gary said we have to get it. So each button uh, of each costume is worn in the right way and looks, uh, looks not only like it's from the 1800s, but it looks like it's, like it's uh, cracked uh, as a poor person would have, even though it might never show up on the screen. And I, and I felt like there's a level of detail that is important to get right the granular stuff that Ed's talking about, but you can go overboard with that um, and never tell the story you want to tell. Because I think, again, your job as a fiction writer is to tell a good story and, a, and an entertaining story. So how important is detail to a novel? I don't know, Kafka wrote America about this country and he begins it with an, with an image of the Statue of Liberty holding up a sword. He got that wrong and it was because he, he didn't do the research, but he wrote a great classic novel anyway. And I think you want to do a little bit better than that, a little bit better than Kafka, right? Uh, but um, I don't know. I think you can get bogged down in that stuff. And if you think, I'm going to make sure every chicken is the right width, then you might be missing the, the bit of characterization or the bit of uh, plot advancement that actually makes the book fun. It, all fiction is a magic trick. And you know, you just have to make it believable enough to get people excited to read it. So I did do research. I did, I did watch a lot of stuff about the 50s. I did read a lot of stuff about the 50s. But I think if I felt obligated to get every last quotidian thing uh, exactly right, as much as, as a book of social science, right, about the 50s, then I would have focused on the wrong thing. So I, I don't know if, does anyone, that, that sort of thing justifies the salary of, of a set designer, but does anyone think, I love Mad Men because the chickens were a little small. I don't know. I don't think that's what's important in storytelling. So, so it's probably the easier, the, the, the more selling answer. But, but here's a funny thing. If I was reading a book about set directors and it had that detail that they had to make sure the chickens were smaller because chickens were smaller then, I would always remember the story or novel that appeared in. So I would, uh, in thinking about Ed's question, I would think it's some sense from that you develop by reading of knowing which details will bring a moment to life and which won't. Like um, that is an amazingly cool detail that I think anyone who's listening to us talk about your book will always remember, which is, hey, do you know that the chickens are smaller in Mad Men because that was a time when they hadn't perfected agronomy. So I think it's well, part of I again, develop that sense from reading. And then uh, go ahead and then- Yeah, but that, that, goes, going back to, but that goes back to Dr. O's thing. You, you just do what you, need, what you need to do to get away with it. So yeah, you pick, you have to get details right because details are 
the building blocks of scenes and scenes in the building block of fiction. So without great details, the fiction is not going to work. So you have to get the details right. I think that's, and, and details like that are a case. So you do have to do research. I'm just saying you could get bogged down. But yeah, I mean, the, I did a lot of research for the book and I think that I, I learned a lot of cool things about the 50s and, and I did put a bunch of them in there. Um, but the, the cars, people had the clothes, the, the real estate, you know, the book is also about the building of New York City, which my grandfather was a part of. Uh, my grandfather had this incredible skill. Um, he's the only one alive who inherited a bunch of big Manhattan sky rises and still managed to end up broke. <laughs> that is a huge, a huge negative accomplishment. And then this is just my last question and I'm going to turn this back over to Heather. Darren, what are, what are books for? Like, you know, this is, it's a tough thing to do and it, it, it takes, it takes alone time and quiet time to fully sort of process a book for the reader. So it is a big journey, both the writer and the reader take. What are they for? What do, what do we get out of them? What do you hope readers get out of them? And what for you as a reader are books for in the end? What's writing for? That's a great and difficult question. I think I'm thinking of Saunders, who you mentioned before. He says, whatever you want to do with a book, be it a social justice message or moral uplift, depends on entertaining the reader. So I think books for the most part are for bringing joy to the reader, pleasure bursts as, uh, as Saunders says. And I think that they bring a more complete version of pleasure than anything else. I mean, I love a great movie, um, but you know, if you watch a great movie, you can look at the sky that a cinematographer paints beautifully and you say, wow, that's beautiful. If you read the Iliad and you see Homer talk about rosy fingered dawn, you get the same picture, but you also get your brain ignited a little bit because you think you get to inhabit the brain of a genius for a little while. Uh, and so I think books are fun in the way movies are fun, but also they give you something more, I think. And, and so the best books I think are for bringing a more sort of complete kind of pleasure than any other art form is capable of. That's cool. Um, okay, uh, Darren, thank you so much. Thanks everyone for attending. Um, and thank you, Sonji and Heather and the, um, the NYU Alumni Association for organizing this great event. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Heather, Sonji. Great. See you guys. Take care. Thanks.